about this panel. This is like my fantasy panel, <laughs> where I was able to bring together all of the directors who I greatly admire and who, quite frankly, have something in common with because they've all been deeply inspired by the work of Irene Cornell. And I feel very strongly that this is an area of Irene's work that is the least discussed, the least understood, the least recorded, the least analyzed. And I think her legacy as a director is extremely important, and this panel is uh, hopefully taking a first step towards trying to uh, correct that omission and to create a robust discussion about around her legacy as a director. So um, I'm going to leave it to Julia Jarko, our chair today, to introduce the panelists. You do have their bios um, in your program so that we can dive right into a robust conversation. Um, but I will introduce briefly Julia Jarko, who's directly to my right. Um, Julia Jarko is an assistant professor in the English department here at NYU, and she graciously uh, agreed to chair today's panel. Um, Julia is uh, one of the very few who is equally fantastic as a scholar and as an artist, which is a rare uh, thing to pull off in this day and age. Um, so she is a, a scholar just publishing um, the book Writing in the Modern Stage, uh, Theater Beyond Drama, which just came out with Cambridge University Press. But she's also a playwright. I have seen a number of her works, including The Terrifying at Abrams Art Center in 2017. She won uh, an Obie for her play, Grimly Handsome. And I think Julie's actually worked with a few of the directors on the panel, but not all of them. So this is also going to be witnessing of these people getting to know each other a little bit, which I think should be delightful. So without further ado, I'm going to pass it over to Julia. One final thing is that we are live streaming via HowlRound. So um, at the end, if we're answering any questions, if we're turning to Q&A, um, you will need to just speak rather loudly, but on your actor voice, so that you can be included in the recording for the live stream. All right? Thank you so much. Thank you so much, um, Gwendolyn. I, uh, uh, when, when Gwendolyn asked me to do this, um, to chair this panel, I, um, I actually had not known that uh, Irene Fornes was a director. Um, so that was something I was excited to learn about. Um, and so just very briefly, um, uh, in case, you know, just to sort of catch us all up, um, it might be interesting in this context to know, if you don't already, that she had originally trained as a painter, um, and that she, uh, in the 60s, had sat in on Lee Strasberg <coughs> sessions at the Actors Studio, and also um, open theater sessions with Joseph Chaikin as a famous student of acting, but also directing. Um, and that uh, starting in 1967, she directed almost all of the premieres of her own plays, um, all the plays that you know you guys have been hearing and hearing about and thinking about over the past couple of days. She also uh, directed um, shows, plays, classics by other writers, including e uh, Ibsen and Chekhov and Kaveron. Um, and, uh, and so I'm excited to um, think with this panel of um, incredible uh, directors about um, maybe about Irene Furness's work uh, as a director, but also the different ways that, that her work may have influenced their own uh, approach to the computer. So I'll just very briefly um, kind of introduce each of them. You have their bios, and I won't, I won't read through the whole thing um, since there are so many of us here. Um, but I'll go in order. So uh, Gisela Cabreras um, is a director who, whose work has been seen all over the world, in Europe and South America, here in the USA. Um, her company is called In Tandem Lab, uh, of which she's the uh, artistic director, is that mm -hmm. right? And, um, and just to, uh, one, uh, one credit as an example, uh, her, her uh, adaptation of Agamemnon uh, won a Drama Desk nomination. Um, then next to her is Tina Satter, who is the writer, uh, director, and artistic director of Half Straddle here in New York, which is an Obie winning company that um, I hope you all have gotten a chance to see. Um, she's the recipient also of the Doris Duke Impact Award, and her work has toured the US, Canada, Europe, Asia, and Australia. Tina also um, wrote her master's thesis at Reed on Fornis, uh, which I did not know that either <laughs> until um, recently. Um, next to Tina is Katie Pearl, 
um, who's a director, playwright, and teacher. She's the co-artistic director of the company Pearl D'Amour, um, with whom she collaborate, uh, for which she collaborates with the playwright uh, Lisa D'Amour. Um, that company also has won an OB, uh, and her work has also gotten grants from the MAC Fund, from the NEA, and from um, Creative Capital. She's the uh, chair of directing at UC San Diego. Um, next to Katie is Elena Arauz, Arauz um, mm -hmm. uh, who, is, uh, who is a director whose uh, recent productions include um, a production of Mud with Boundless and uh, a really fascinating adaptation of uh, A Chronicle of the Madness of Small Worlds by Matt Wilman um, next to <laughs> at Mirror Theater Workshop, which uh, you guys got to see. It was pretty fantastic. Um, and then finally, Alice Regan um, is a director in New York who has engaged extensively also with Fornes' work um, in various ways, I guess foremost among them being uh, directing a bunch of her plays. Mm -hmm. um, I won't uh, read all of them. She's, the, uh, she's an associate professor of professional practice and directing uh, at Barnard, and, um, and you probably just saw the reading of Fomna, which she uh, directed open the theater space. So um, each of these people is going to talk for a little while about um, Fornes and her uh, influence on their work. Um, and then we will maybe talk a little bit amongst ourselves, and then we will very quickly thereafter open it up to discussion. Um, so Yeah. OK. Um, so let me start here. So I, I want to approach Maria Irene Fornes uh, with the spirit of student. I mean, that's the feeling I get as a director when I think about her. As someone who still is in the constant journey of learning a craft with humility, one who recognizes a master in her own right and the pride of the student that is able to recognize that your teacher is a master. Um, when I started working, um, in theater back in the 80s, I, I was born in Peru in South America, and where I was born, I lived inside a narrative where women could at best be actresses in theater or maybe poets, but not playwrights, directors. That was not something I could understand as part of my world. Um, and I feel like her work, when, she, when, when I have the chance to meet her work, Encountering Maria Nance Fornes' work in my life opened a wider narrative for me. I think that in some way I lived in my body what she does to her characters. Uh, debunkment of history and causal consequences, consequences, the possibility of closely observing and embodying alternative realities and the capacity of making the familiar, uh, familiar than familiar, and because of that to make the things that I thought were impossible possible. Um, sometimes I feel that my biggest enemy and, and our biggest enemy as, as women artists can be, it's a mode of seeing the world which thinks it knows in advance what is worth and possible and what is not. Uh, learning about her work and her history placed me in a different landscape, uh, a landscape that uh, what Cantor gave to me and Mushkin has given to me and my work have challenged my notions of the work we do the way we do it, and how I uh, locate inside this uh, inheritor, inheritance. Um, I, in particular, feel that, that for me, it was a huge opening to see an artist that could direct and write and that was a painter at the same time. That is something that is always got in my work. Uh, I started as an actress. I moved to directing, and currently, I'm also sort of writing. I will never reach the mastery of the master, but I feel that it was very inspiring to have her as a role model. Um, another thing that for me was very important is that her work is a theater of the flesh. Uh, I'm not going to talk about the first time I read one of the plays. I will talk about the first time I put my hands, my body, uh, inside one of her texts, inside of her body, her artistic body. Um, women must write women, said Ellen Sixtius in The Love of the Medusa. We must let our kidneys, our unconsciousness, our irrationality, our fluids out and flow in our work, in our body. When I approached Tango Palace, that was in 2010, when uh, when did the uh, Fornes Festival here in New York, it was at the Cherry Lane, 
Um, I got in touch with the viscerality of Forness directly, with a woman who soared in her maleness and her femaleness. I heard the echo. I found a kindred animal of the pack. I was directing a reading. Quite honestly, I'm not very interested in directing readings. Uh, I only believe what the body can do and cause on stage. Uh, um, in what words, breath, and sound can provoke in the soul of our audiences. When we started prepping for the reading, uh, Fournette's words carried such muscularity that we had to jump on the stage. Um, I had two actors, two writers, Mead and Adjur Gupta. We started sitting down and reading, and all of a sudden, there was no way you could read that text without connecting it to the body. And I had my actors with the scripts in hand, moving all over the place, and you know, not only giving, giving their souls to create flesh on stage, and all of a sudden, I think Irene imposed her way. It showed us a journey, you know, a reading for her, is a ring that is open to all these possibilities. So we ended up scripting hand without blocking or anything, just making it happen as an event. And one of, of the biggest memories of that moment is that they, Irene, they brought Irene to the reading and she was in the back and she was saying some of the words uh. of Tanga Palace. She was not talking to anybody at that point and she was just repeating the words. And I will never forget, you know, the feeling in my heart, you know, is the is theater that is in the flesh, that even when your mind is in some other space, you're still there, you're still present reacting to that. Um, that experience changed me profoundly. There was something in her work that was so hyper real and intense, so against the Aristotelian standard. For Ness, with her work, opens doors, invite us to walk in a play and play inside. And you will never come out the same uh, after living with her inside her body, her body of work. Tango Palace was an experiment in writing, as she said, in, but also in writing myself as an artist. And the possibility of writing uh, has always been a secret desire of me. And I think as a director, I, I feel like we write on stage. So from there to writing with words, there's you know a little a breath away. I feel like there's the distance of a breath. Um, that's all I have of what she changed me. Thank you. <laughs> um, yeah, so I'm going to uh, I'll kind of talk initially a little bit how I came to write my thesis on Maria Irene Fornes, because I was in at Reed College in a Master of Arts and Liberal Studies program, and I had, wasn't even really, I had no theater background at that point, but I was just starting to get interested in it from my brief um, stint as being a bad actress. Mm -hmm. um, and I didn't like being an actress, but I was interested by then in um, theater, and this was about 15 years ago. Very, but I hadn't studied it. I'd been an English um, undergraduate before grad school, and but I was taking classes in uh, playwriting and directing while at Reed. And for my directing class, we had to direct a small excerpt or a short play for the final thing. And I'm like, oh, I just want to direct my own writing. And the teacher was like, oh, you don't want to do that. It's really hard. You're not supposed to do that. And I was, I was completely naively confused. I was like, what do you mean? I know exactly how this should go. It's like, <laughs> it was really confusing to me that he, I wouldn't direct what I had written. And, then he, and then he was like, all right, all right. Because I was, it, uh, and then he was like, okay, here's someone I had never heard of, Maria Irene Fornes. And it was this really seminal thing. So I looked her up and started reading about her and reading her plays. And it was I immediately clicked in in a huge way. And then went on to do my thesis on her and write and direct my own play as, uh, as part of that final thesis project. And, um, and it was on, like, I sort of wrote something on her idea of theatricalized realism. Um, and her plays that theatricalize emotional transactions, both inward and outward, operate from a core feminist ethos and frame the intangible interior magic of everyday connections have been the most immediate influence on my own work as a playwright and director. Um, and then I wrote a really short piece. A few years ago, Maria received the Edwin Booth Award at the CUNY Graduate Center. And so I was asked to write a short thing, so I'm just going to read that, and it's not explicitly on her direction, but I find that so fused with her playwriting in a bunch of ways, so I'll just read this and it's quite short, but um, 
It's called A Kind of Theatrical Realism, An Emotional Landscape Based in the Realness. A character P. My God, what is it? A character Ro. It's a newspaper. P. It is beautiful. Ro nods. P. May I touch it? Ro nods. P touches the paper. A tear rolls down his face. P. This must be made by a person. Ro. Yes, many of them. They put out a new one each day. These opening lines of dialogue are from one of my very favorite pieces that Marie Irene Fornes wrote, a small play called Drowning from a collection called Orchards, where playwrights wrote short plays in response to Chekhov's short stories. P and Ro are heartbreaking and hilarious as described by Fornes in the first stage direction in the play. P and Ro's heads are large and shapeless like potatoes. They have warts on their faces and necks. Their bodies are also like potatoes. And this first tiny section of dialogue from a tiny play encapsulates poetically and perfectly what Maria does with her art, the way her writing excavates our senses over and over again, the way she holds up a delicate but earthy and honest mirror to our humanity and its reflection casts back micro heartbeats and macro intellectual considerations of self-discovery, difference, desire, and the sadness of our moments girded by an unrelenting hope drawn from our very existences. When Fornes renders an odd potato creature moved to tears by seeing the object of a newspaper, then elevates the context with just eight words, they put out a new one each day. She imbues language and life with a sense of possibility that is both banal and then wholly revelatory. To those who are lucky enough to know Fornes's words, ideas, and art, and many, many more should, we get access to what I definitively think art can and should do. Her plays open up the edges of ourselves and our present moments in ways that are utterly singular to each reader or audience member and then reflect widely on the past, future, and present to lead to this tweaking of what we thought we knew, which she presents to us. In my thesis on Fornes, I wrote, at Reed College, I called this effect theatricalized realism and what I believe Fornes did, did since she operated as writer and director was imbue the writing with a director's incisive and highly imaginative use of all the tricks of theatrical thinking to crack open what our other sage master, Mac Wellman, calls the already known. Thank God. We need all the questioning, <coughs> considering, and repurposing of the already known we can get. From Fafu and her friends with its incredible rendering of a female landscape, to the laser intense darkness of mud, to my favorite of her plays, The Danube, that uses language in the most awesomely simple way to delineate what is also deceptively an epic of romance, family, and illness. I think Fornes is always doing one thing, placing words on the page to be animated in performance in order to consider the ways we never stop trying to communicate all kinds of love. In some sense, it is that simple, in which her plays, and why her plays, which are masterpieces, also have that simple, tight feeling in each one. Near the end of Drowning, the character of P says, do you know what it is to need someone? The feeling is so much deeper than words can ever say. Do you know what despair is, anguish? What it is that makes someone a link between you and your own life? Fernez offers us this intangible link every time we read her work, each play that we see. Her theatrical creations are an ongoing link between ourselves and life. Great. So uh, before I start, I just want to briefly correct something in my introduction, which is that I'm not the um, chair of directing at UCSD, but I did hold the position of the Quinn Martin Distinguished Guest Chair of Directing in 2017 and 2018, which was actually where I was able to direct Irene's play, What of the Night, which is the only play of Irene's I've directed full, fully. Um, so, uh, I didn't really meet Irene through her work. Um, I, in 2013, I met and fell in love with the woman who was making a documentary about Irene Fornes. And um, uh, in the process of falling in love with Michelle, Michelle was deeply in love with Irene mm -hmm. and deeply committed to her and so by extension I began to become deeply in love with Irene and deeply committed to her and I eventually became a producer on the film 
And so I would say for the past five years, Irene has been a, a, a huge part of my life, um, both as a, a learning and meeting her as a mentor and an artist, but also spending time with her in Amsterdam House as the person she is today, um, and thinking a lot about um, both of those things, being with the film and also being with Irene, has made me think a lot about lineage mm. and um, how sometimes you can move through life and not realize that you are part of a lineage mm. until suddenly it, it is shown mm -hmm. and shows up in front of your eyes, which is one of the things Michelle's film did for me, was help me recognize that I'm part of a um, a long time surge of energy and questioning that Irene was was one of the initial like drops of like stones in the water and we're still feeling her ripples today uh, however I did meet Irene as a playwright when I was a freshman in college um, a mentor of mine, an amazing director named Kim Rubenstein, uh, was directing a play of Irene's called Sarita, and oh. called Sarita, and uh, and I assisted Kim on that production. And what I remember about it was feeling almost my only response to it at that time was feeling its foreignness. Mm -hmm. It felt so awkward to me as a play. The rhythms of it. I, I couldn't connect to the way the songs kind of came in, the language that the characters were using to speak and the rhythms of that language, and also the passion, the heights of passion that that play goes to. Mm. It just, I could not connect to any of it. And so I didn't really understand why people were so excited or why this mentor of mine, Kim, was so excited about this play. Mm -hmm. And then in production, the, the kind of DIY quality of the set, which I, which I know now is very in keeping with Irene's original productions, but all of that seemed like quite a mystery. Mm -hmm. And then a few years later, uh, in a directing class, I said, well, why don't I just direct this first scene of Sarita and try to understand it a little bit better. So then I took the next step towards, as Gisela was saying, you, you get your hands on it and you get inside of it. And um, what I felt once I was on the inside, what I found is that from the inside, the dialogue wasn't stiff, it was urgent and it was economical, mm -hmm. incredibly economical. And that the actions and words were driven by passions that were clear, direct, and accessible and not obfuscated mm -hmm. by, they just like were there. Mm -hmm. They were recognizable. And I remember thinking that there wasn't a lot of clutter in the play, there wasn't a lot of extra. So, uh, so now let's fast forward to just uh, three years ago uh, when I when Michelle took me to Amsterdam House where I met Irene for the first time um, and in my mind at that point she was really this grand dame of the theater <laughs> and um, and her importance had been elevated really high and so I wanted to you know pay my respects and I wanted to sort of sit at the feet of the master and I was going to meet her and I was really nervous and also I wanted Michelle to think that I was good at being with <laughs> Irene so there were all sorts of crazy stakes happening um, and what I encountered who I encountered in that moment was an old lady um, with really amazing cheekbones mm -hmm. in a wheelchair um, whose hands eyes and mouth were the most present parts of her and the most active parts of her. And those three, and ears at that point. Um, and those aspects of her were where I was able to connect. And as many people talk about their experiences being with her, especially a few years ago, when you are present with her, sh she immediately goes to touch and to stroking. And um, because for those of you who don't know, she's in, has been um, moving through stages of dementia um, 
and at that time she was still pretty pretty active and pretty present. So I sat with her for about an hour, Michelle, and we were at the piano, and we played a little piano, we sang songs, and she um, had uh, maracas and tambourine. Mm -hmm. um, but mostly, we got into this sort of fugue state where she was just with my hand, using my hand, um, all over her face and neck and kissing it. And, um, and I realized that I was, um, it was both in, immensely important that I was myself and also not important at all, that I was every woman or person she had ever loved in that moment or cared for or been cared by. And she took us directly to where the tactile meets the emotional. Um, my notes are on my cell phone. Uh, flash forward to something even more recently, just about a month and a half ago, Irene's apartments are, um, which she still has in the West Village, are finally being sold. And uh, they've never been emptied out. They've just been sitting there with all of her stuff in it for many, many years. So I and a few other people, Morgan Janess, uh, her, uh, someone who was her agent for a long time, and another friend, Yana Landown, went to try to help the Guardian figure out what to do with all this stuff and what needs to be saved. Now, when she um, first left her homes, we made sure I wasn't part of that process at that moment, but many of her papers are already at NYU fails. But we knew that there was a lot more in her apartment that needed to be fa um, saved. And um, being in her apartment also was revelatory in terms of thinking of her as an outsider artist, um, which she is in that she's always been a little bit or a lot on the outside of the mainstream theater, but that quality that I've grown to recognize with outsider artists where they just can't stop creating, no matter what is around them becomes art. And very specifically, Irene was also identified really strongly as a costume designer, and so her whole apartment had like mountains of clothes mm -hmm. piled up. But she also had this huge series of boxes that had shoes of different sizes or um, little trinkets, but they were all, she had sewn like a padded cover around each of these shoe boxes and was, had written very carefully stenciled on them what was in them. So even the con things that contained the things that helped her make her art were also art. Um, and then uh, also recently, uh, Michelle and I were curious about whether we could use all the outtakes of her film to create a live performance, because there was so much that didn't end up in the film that was really wonderful of Irene talking to the camera. So we took all this footage to Brown University to see if we could make a live performance happen. And in preparing for that, I did this deep dive of reading probably 90% of her plays and went on this hunt for all of the connective threads that connect all of them and began to see so clearly these obsessions and fascinations that she came back to again and again and again. So the forms of all her plays are different, but these topics and obsessions and conversations that characters have show up in every single one. Like people are constantly talking about work and jobs. People are constantly um, talking about language and the importance of language. Um, the, the negotiation and exchange about love, whether it's sexual love or romantic love, and how love is used for power, or how language is used for power, all these things that became her personal economic system was really fascinating to me. And it taught me that never again can I direct the work of a playwright, I don't think, without really looking at their whole entire body of work because when I moved into directing What of the Night, that knowing what to look for in it was the only way I was able to get inside um, that play, which is huge. So when I decided to direct What of the Night, um, I, I felt this huge sense of responsibility because as a director, you're always hearing, well, no, you know, it, it is really hard to direct a Maria Irene Fornes play, and like nobody can direct Irene Fornes, 
the way Irene can direct it. And there was this sense almost of like, don't even try because mm -hmm. you're going to fail. So I, and also Michelle's standards are really high. And so I wanted to do her proud, but mostly I wanted to do Irene justice because if you're going to direct one of Irene's plays, I feel like you have to start asking yourself, what does this play require so that Irene's play can be heard because it's so easy for it to collapse mm -hmm. under like excessive emotionality mm -hmm. or like extra concept added on top mm -hmm. of that. So I, I wanted to make something that I felt like Irene would not hate, that Irene would be like, okay, you did, a, you did my play and I can see my play in there. I wanted to read the messages that she puts in the dialogue. So one thing, one anecdote about Irene is that she knew that one of the first things directors or stage managers are taught to do is to cross out all the stage directions in these mm -hmm. scripts. And so if she wanted something to happen on stage, she would make sure that the act, that the characters said it to each other. Like if she wanted a toaster, she would say, have somebody say like, could you, could you pass me a piece of toast that just popped out of that toaster? Mm. She would say it better than that. Um, and so I wanted to help my actors understand that there was logic and information in the text, similarly to how I was trained to um, access Shakespeare. That Shakespeare, you can discover what needs to be happening on stage by looking at the actual text. Um, I, I knew that she was so strong in her writing voice and I needed to challenge myself to be her match. So one thing um, Ken Preston Enzi, who's sitting here today, said yesterday, in fact, that when you direct an Irene Fornes play, you have to be ready to kick its ass because it is gonna kick right back at you. <laughs> and that, that that doesn't mean like I have to be super smart and bring a lot of cleverness on top of it. It just means that I have to understand the vision. I have to choose amongst all of those obsessions and fascinations that her characters are talking about, which one is most important to be heard for me right now or for like this time right now and I have to I have to make sure the play is allowed to to speak that so her impact on me as a director um, are the lessons I've taken away from her are that I need to be selfish and fearless about demanding my own vision um, and I need to trust myself and not start second-guessing based on shoulds or based on past um, precedent. There's a scene in, in the film where she's directing, I don't, I don't even know if it's her play, but she, she gets up on stage and she shows this sort of large man who's clearly not a very trained actor how to walk across the stage like this. And so he's like laughing and sort of embarrassed and then he goes and he tries it and she's like, no, 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 no. Like you go back and you do it like this. And so I always think about that. Mm -hmm. um, another lesson, push it farther. Another lesson is that real and surreal are two parts of the same moment. It's not about choosing one or the other. She's a, I found that her plays, re, or at least the one I worked on, really came alive when I was able to try to find that balance between both. Um, and that speaking in terms of tempo rather than psychology is a really practical tool. Um, I've been talking for a while, so I'll stop right there. <laughs> well, good, though. Thanks. Um, hi, my name is Elena Arauz, and um, I have only met Fornes through her work. I've never met her in person. I really um, don't know very much about her as a person, um, only what you can read in, in uh, academic journals and papers and through friends of hers. But I was introduced to her in graduate school, to her work, and I thought, wow, this is really late in my theatrical life, mm -hmm. um, having made it to graduate school, to be learning about and learning the body of work of somebody who's um, such an important American playwright. And then in graduate school, I found at a used bookstore this copy of Mud, and it was not the copy that's, current, that's sold within the anthology, it was just the script itself, and it was typed. Um, and I bought it for $3, and I read it, and um, I became obsessed with it completely. Because I think the thing about that play and about so many of her plays is that it affirmed a style and aesthetic that I have loved 
but have not been able to find much in the American theater. And I've found it in other places. I've, I've found it in Belgian theater with uh, Gelderode. I find it in Italian theater with Commedia dell'arte. I found it in, with French theater with um, Grand Guignol. Mm -hmm. um, I find it in uh, Balinese theater with their dance drama. And I find it in Latin American literature, certainly um, Borges and, um, and novelists and short story writers and playwrights um, like him. But there's something about her and her style, which I found completely unique. And as I've been now starting to direct her work, what I think about her style, and this is just my um, observation, and maybe not how she would um, discuss or talk about her own work, but I, I think what she gives us is um, a stark and honest portrayal of humans acting on their most honest and most horrible animal instincts bordering on the grotesque and with outlandish humor. And so um, I realize where this comes from, because I wonder, why do I like this so much? And I, I grew up on a whole bunch of really dark, spooky fairy tales with a lot of action adventure movies and a lot of episodic storytelling. And I think when I combine that with then um, my acting training, which is all in classical theater, so very language-based, and I became very obsessed with every piece of punctuation and every consonant and every vowel and the action that's behind those things. And then to go on to study Commedia dell'arte as a performer and um, physicality of that action and the humor that comes with it. All of those things I found rolled up in uh, Fornes. And um, I think she balances the grotesque and the comedic in a way that nobody else does. So, um, the other thing that, the other reason I, I think I was also really attracted to her work and continue to be attracted to her work is that I feel like she writes about poverty in an organic way, which I, I don't think um, I also see as often in the American theater. Um, it's a, for the most part, and I'm being general here, it's a, it's a, um, there's a privilege to be able to be a theater artist, right? And many theater artists and certainly many people who go to the theater don't really understand poverty, really understand poverty. And I think whether Fornes understood it from any kind of personal experience or not, I think that there's something in her plays where she's able to express um, what poverty is from understanding it from the inside as opposed to speaking from above it and looking down on it. And uh, that's something just from my, my perspective that I really appreciate. And I also think that because, from my understanding, that she used all kinds of writing and directing techniques to disrupt her own uh, thought process to be more inventive and to um, silence any kind of voice in her head which told her how it had to be done, that what you get in these plays are these massive surprises. Mm -hmm. And that as much as it disrupted her, it also disrupts the audience. And these 180 degree turns and, and these shifts in these characters are so exciting to me. And what I've become more and more aware of is because of these mad tangential, sometimes, sometimes seemingly tangential shifts, what are the 10 thoughts that get you from point A to point B? And I've come to realize for myself that I think these characters, I'm starting to find these characters and helping actors find these characters by what is not said more so than what is said. So what is said gets you so far, and then what are those 10 thoughts in between? How do they get from one place to the other? And in that silence is the fear. And when you understand the fear of these characters, and you understand their desperate, animalistic need for survival, then I think that's when you get to something really exciting. I'm always looking for the animal in these characters. And of course, you know, in all of her plays, um, as you know, she, um, most of them have, she talks about most of her characters as animals and elides them with animals. Um, and then the other thing is in those shifts, right, um, all of her characters, even those who are completely illiterate, are funny and they're witty and their language is precise and their punctuation is perfect. 
And um, so when I'm ever I'm directing Fornes, I'm scouring the play for every joke, <laughs> every joke. And there's so many of them. They're hysterically funny. I mean, I, I make it a practice that when I approach a tragedy, I pr approach it like a comedy because I believe that when you fall in love with characters, you fall in love with them because of you're either laughing with them or at them. And when you can laugh with them or at them, you can see yourselves in them and you can see your own foibles in them and then you can cheer for them. Um, I, so the first play of hers that I've worked on and the only play that I've done to complete full production so far is um, Mud. And when I was asked to do Mud by a Boundless Theater Company here, which is based in New York and in Puerto Rico, and is, um, the artistic director is Maria Cristina Puste. Um, she, as soon as she had this idea, I said, yes, absolutely, I want to do Mud. And then I thought, okay, I'm sure Fornes has already done this play perfectly. Why am I doing this play? Why do we need a produ another production of it? And as I reread the play, I thought, this is what's so sad about Fornes' work, is that it never goes out of style. Mm -hmm. She's writing about, it, it never is not relevant. She's writing about, you know, poverty, abuse, domestic abuse, sexual abuse, systemic oppression, dictatorships, mm -hmm. fascism, and it never seems dated. Her plays are never dated, and that's what's um, a, a testament to her writing, but also how sad our world is. Mm -hmm. And so I decided um, to be brave and to not do any research on how she had done the play, and to not look at any photos of what she had done in, in the design and working with her designers, and to just approach it as why this play for this audience at this time? And why this play for a New York audience at this time? And so um, I had at it, and I decided, just like I would treat any other great writer, that all the clues would be in the text. And so the clues that really stuck out to me, and uh, well, first off, the title, Mud, and yet the stage directions so clearly imply that the set is incredibly dry, and there's no mud on the set. So immediately I understood that for myself to mean that mud is a metaphorical mud, that these characters are stuck in a mud of situations that have either been forced upon them or that they've created themselves. And then the other big clue for me was this um, brilliant blue sky that's outside the window that you can see through the door. And so you've got this, uh, these characters stuck in the mud and yet there's this brilliant blue sky. And I thought, wow, that's the center of hope and the center of ambition and the center of potential for the future that they can't reach. Not only can they not reach it, but they never seem to see it, yet the audience always sees it. And it's, I thought, okay, that's what this play is. It's, it's, it's those days when your life feels so down and you're so stuck in the mud. And if you just went outside and looked up, maybe you'd feel a little bit better. Um, of course, their circumstances are much more difficult than just feeling lazy on a Sunday. And then the other thing that I thought was really interesting is the eight second freezes that she has between each scene. And I thought, why? Why are these eight second freezes? And why are they so specific as eight seconds? And then I thought, oh, of course, right? This is the kind of stage direction you put into the play after you've directed it for the first time or after you've workshopped it. And I thought, okay, she must have not been able to get a blackout. She must have not been able to make a transition in the way that the audience could understand a transition. So if you freeze them, then everybody knows, okay, that scene's done. And when I start again, the next scene's coming up. And then I actually found out that that might be true. It was in your class that you told me that. Yeah. And so I decided, well, then do I need these eight second things? Why, why are they there? I'll just get rid of them. And I thought, no, 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 I'm going to lean into this. She kept them in the script for a reason. And so we lent leaned ourselves into these, uh, these eight seconds. We made them eight seconds, which really is a really long time. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, what I came to find, what's amazing about those moments was um, the portrait, the little picture, the photograph that the playwright leaves you with at the most intense moment of the play. And what is it that you have to remember of that scene to then take into the next scene? And so how does the play then spiral out of control um, so those are the things that I just sort of, those are the clues, that's all I had, and I was like, now I'm going to jump in. And um, the other thing that, um, so then I took that, and I've been now workshopping Conduct of Life with the Wilma Theater in, um, with their Hot House um, Actors cohort, and uh, it's been pretty astounding because I feel, 
I feel so much of the same thing. The language does it all. The play is all about the humor. If you can get the humor and you can get the jokes, both physical and, um, and um, you know, verbal, then you have fallen in love with these characters. And then when you start to really figure out what is not said, you start to get the real fear of even characters like Orlando. And there's nothing, nothing worse and more scary in this world than a fearful man with a temper and a weapon. Mm -hmm. And that's when I thought, okay, this is what this play really is. You know, this is why this play is so terrifying. This is where um, dictatorship comes from, is um, fearful men with a temper and too many weapons. Mm -hmm. and, um, and so I've just been leaning into that. And then suddenly, Orlando becomes not just a stock character, but a real person. Mm -hmm. And then I think you can, I think, for me at least, I started to understand what she was saying about dictatorship, what she was standing ab saying about abuses of power, what she was saying about oppression of women and systemic um, oppression of women, and certainly how we hold wives down and how we hold our, you know, people we're torturing down. Um, so that's sort of been my way in, and what I have found um, pretty amazingly is that um, Fornes continues to stay with me as I direct everything else. And the tools and lessons that I'm learning from working on her plays have stuck with me. So for example, this is just a very small example. Right, uh, the next show that I'm doing is um, Romeo and Juliet with um, Shakespeare Festival St. Louis. And I've been thinking a lot about Romeo and a lot about Juliet. And I've decided <laughs> the play's really about Romeo and not about Juliet. But um, the thing about Juliet, I'm like, well, what is Juliet? What is Juliet? And what is she? And I've been talking to the costume designer. You know, what does Juliet look like? How are we gonna portray Juliet? What is she gonna wear? You know, and I feel like okay, Fornes never went for the cliche choice, and and so what is the idea behind the idea? And I could put her in white and tell everybody really quickly she's a virgin. I could put her in pink and tell everybody she's a she's young. And then I thought, no, you know, Juliet is hope. Juliet is hope in the play. She's the brilliant blue sky that's outside of the window in mud. She's the hope and the potential for the future. She's, when Romeo sees her, she says, you are the, he says, you are the sun. You are the light that gets me, wants to get me out of my dark night as he lives in sort of perpetual um, melancholy. And for the friar, she's the hope that if the two marry, the war, the civil war between these two families might actually stop. And so suddenly I'm like, oh, I'm doing a Fornes play. This is awesome. And so we're putting her in blue, um, this bright, bright, brilliant blue. And, and I, I just realized that Fornes is seeping into everything because, because of that amazing ability to, um, that, that obsession I have with that, the funny and the tragedy and the tragic and the funny and the grotesque with the comedic and, um, and if we can get both of those things in every play, that's what I'm most excited about. I feel really full right now. <laughs> <laughs> um, I have notes too. Uh, my name is Alice Regan. I want to say thank you for Gwendolyn for putting our panels together. And, and I was really excited when I saw all of your games. Mm -hmm. my favorite people. Um, I feel like, uh, I feel no when I read a porn arts play. And I know I'm not the only I feel like I understand her rhythms, I feel like I understand her words, her textures, and that everything she writes is true and weird and sexy and violent. And I'm all down for that. <laughs> <laughs> um, when I'm directing a Four Nights play, I think it's like the best sex, the best play. Um, I feel vulnerable and I feel strong, both those things. Because I feel like she's stripping away that she strips away social nicety and she gets down to the heart of what people want and, mm -hmm. that, and so we're dealing with desire in every scene and I'm mm -hmm. so into that um, and I didn't know she said that she compared how she compared her characters to animals I thought I came up with that I feel really <laughs> I still feel smart because I, I, I heard people remind me of animals and when I'm directing her play I feel like an animal too I feel really fierce and really single minded and hungry um, and crafty, and I feel like that's what you know. What case that you have to bring your best mm -hmm. self to her because the play will keep you back. So true. Sure. Mm -hmm. um, like the other women here, I discovered Fornes in college. I think it's really depressing that none of us discovered Fornes by seeing a production mm -hmm. by somebody else at regional theater. Mm -hmm. Talk about that out there. 
Um, I grew up Catholic, and there's a lot of focus in my life on sin and how to avoid it. <laughs> so, at the time I, when I admitted I hit puberty, I was looking for models of women who were morally corrupt because they wanted to be. You get away with it. Um, or morally corrupt and damaged. And I was just like, that was the thing I was looking for. And I found it in Fornes. Um, her pleasure is full of those kind of women who say fuck it, who just, you know, want, they want what they want, they're going to go after it, and sometimes they're damaged by that, and sometimes they win. Um, and I think that's become my whole project as a director, is people, and the, the center of my play is always a woman who is going after what she wants. Uh, a woman who thinks consciously about her own desires, if it's sexual, if it's intellectual, which for us is great for that, um, if it's spiritual. Um, there are the specific ways that Fornes has impacted me as a director are as follows. Um, <laughs> uh, I don't know, I'm getting this from interviews and from talking with her designers. I talked to some of her other designers um, a couple years ago. And one thing I, I took away that I want to, that I try to take up is to meet people where they are. That means the actors, that means the designers and the characters from the plays. Um, to use who people are and what they're bringing to the table, even if they're lost or confused or young or wrong, that the people you're working with are gonna bring something to the table and, and it feels like she met her collaborators with such an open mind and open heart and got the best out of them. She didn't try to change anybody. Um, and I think she worked with a lot of different kinds of people and made her, and her plays were better for it. Mm -hmm. um, just to realize that people are enough as they are and that you yourself are enough. Um, the second thing that I try to learn from Parnas is not to talk down to the audience. Um, that no one needs to be led by the nose through a story. No one, none, no one in the audience needs to be taught how to understand the play. Um, the audience is as smart as you are. Mm -hmm. um, and, no one even, and, and no one in the audience even, even has to like what you do. They don't have to like it or agree with it. And I think the artist I admire most, in addition to Fornes, adhere to this. Um, it's not about the audience, which is a little bit heretical to say right now, because I feel like every theater maker is like, it's the audience, it's the community, it's what, you know, who's coming in the door, how do we get to confuse in the door? And I don't think Fornes really worried about that. I think she made the place for herself. Um, just, just to throw some other names out there, people who I think do, do this is Robert Woodruff, Joanna Colitis, Richard Foreman, Katie Mitchell, Julia Jarko, Audrey mm -hmm. Kennedy, Machnack Wellman. These are artists who you know, make the work for themselves because they like it. And the third, this leads to number three, which is lesson from Fornes is drill down. Drill down to what you like. This is what you said, okay, right? It's like, what do you, what, what's, what's important to you? Go after that. Get all the crap out of the way and go after what you want and then the play will be good. Um, and the fourth and last thing that I learned from Fornes is pleasure as well as darkness is part of life. And usually they're in the same moment. Thank you. How are you? I have questions, but I actually first want to ask you guys if you have questions or, or thoughts for each other, having said and listened. I just, that last concept about uh, Fornes not caring about the audience is super fascinating mm -hmm. and I feel a relationship to that that I started to f when I, I realized this last year that I didn't care about the audience and I said it out loud at this thing and I was like holy shit that's crazy mm -hmm. but anyways um, but I that's I just hearing that said is super interesting especially in this moment for the reasons you said but I was thinking of this thing I that I that I had read about her when I was doing my work and I think is true that, because she's kind of late to starting to be a theater maker. She's in mm -hmm. her late 20s when mm -hmm. she starts. And I believe she's in France and she sees a play of Waiting for Godot and she did not speak French. And she writes or said, I, knew, I couldn't understand one word that was happening, but I was like, I have to do this. And I, so that feels tied to me so much to then being a director who's like making these texts that need Mm -hmm. And to maybe this concept that, yes, she's making this thing, and it's if she, like, 
she wasn't sitting there like, they're, oh, someone's going to be in the audience. What if they don't speak French? Or what if this is being made as the way I'm a maker making it, and, if, and then you're there, and that's the exchange, and it's less tending to the superficialities of an audience's needs. And I, somehow that, of her actually having that experience of a thing that she literally, on the verbal level, couldn't understand but would totally changed her whole life is, feels really an a, a important part, sort of texture of her trajectory mm -hmm. it, yeah mm -hmm. I'm, uh, I'm struck actually that it, it seems to me um, hearing all of these great thoughts that there are um, you know that you can talk about Farnese's work in a way that um, sort of uh, points up its continuities with the theater work the dramatic work that we kind of already know how to value <coughs> Um, or you can talk about it uh, in a way that emphasizes its difference and its strangeness. And obviously, I think everyone has done a little bit of both. Um, but I guess I'm curious what you all think about um, about kind of uh, if you. I know several of you are teachers. Probably, probably we all find ourselves teaching at some point. And um, I'm sort of curious, like what what you would most want, either students or younger artists, what you would most want to help them see in Fornes, what you would want um, to show them. You know, even though we know we're not supposed to want that kind of thing for our students, they're supposed to get it for themselves, but like secretly, your desire, um, what would you want? I think that um, I teach too. I teach at Princeton University, I teach on acting and directing, and I think the thing that I'm always talking to my students about is um, how can we work with abandon? How can we know the work so well, do the homework, whatever, and then work with abandon? And I feel in just reading her work that she works with both abandon and rebelliousness. And that's the kind of artist I hope to one day be, <laughs> is to be able to work with that level of abandon and that level of, of just rebelling. Because mm -hmm. um, that's exciting to watch, I think. I just think there's, her plays are so important for students to read because there's like this deeper feminist bedrock in them that it just vibrates off them that we don't get in very many other plays that are frequently taught. And it's just, it's less even about the craft or exactly what she's doing, but that it, there's not, just within them, not from the outside, they are about the f this female character in space. And I, I don't know if that operates on every student, but to me it's really important that that gets in front of their brains and hearts, that they at least see an example of her plays. And I, because I can't think of many other writers you're taught, even at the college level, that just crack in. And I think for all of us, it sounds like that's what happened and to me it's I mean there's a lot of things I could talk specifically about and everyone here definitely could more than me but like there's an intangibility to what she is up to that is so important to me and I she's it's not because I think it's not even like she's like I'm showing female characters she's just showing characters mm -hmm. and then they're mm -hmm. they're in her world they're the female like I you know what I mean mm -hmm. there and I that is so singular I, that uh, at what she's doing, and I, yeah, I just think it's important mm -hmm. that we continue to shove that in people's faces. Actually, so. I um, I completely I couldn't agree with you more, yeah. um, especially about um, even though I don't believe from what I've heard, because again I haven't met her, um, that she wouldn't call herself a feminist. So certainly it is right. The work is so feminist. What I'm particularly fascinated by right now, and this is just getting to, I think, why Fornes and her work continues to be silenced, is, um, so I'm, I'm, I'm pretty obsessed with doing Conduct of Life right now, and um, two theater companies who have asked for a Fornes work that I've spoken to have said no to it because of the uh, portrayal of sexual violence against women. Mm -hmm. And um, as much as I argue, well, until sexual violence goes away, we need to keep showing it so we can keep talking about it, um, that doesn't seem to be a strong enough argument for them. And what's interesting is this idea of um, if we continue to, 
that that showing a, a woman in that position is actually not not feminism. It's anti-feminism, and so. Um, by propagating these ideas, we're somehow doing a disservice. And so I'm, I'm just particularly interested in the two sides of people, you know, the theater makers who are like, we need to show this, we need to be talking about this. Again, her plays are still relevant. They haven't, these problems have not gone away. She's talking about deep problems that um, society is still scared to talk about. And then other people who are like, no, we don't talk about those things. And we certainly don't show them in the theater. And we certainly don't make money by showing them in the theater. So it's particularly a fascinating time to talk about her feminist right. bent mm -hmm. and, yeah. the, and those female characters who are all victims. I know, because to your point, that was also super fascinating of how timeless this stuff is. And I, because she doesn't situate it, like she wasn't making a topical right. play about a female. She was, that was, she was writing this experience out, like theatrically writing it out. But when does she write Conduct of Life? Is that in the 70s it's or 80s? Okay, yeah, it's, mm -hmm. I, I mean, that play is so intense, I almost couldn't read it the first time I read it. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking of it in 2018, I don't know, it's a fascinating, mm -hmm. and that you're running up against that. Mm -hmm. I think that, going back to your question about what I would like to give the students, I think to my acting students, um, which I'm planning to give some of her material, is to understand that there are different ways of connecting the spirit of a character, that there is not only the Aristotelian, traditional way uh, th that asking the questions of where I am, what, what is my journey inside, doesn't have necessarily one narrative, which is something that we've been led, for me, mistakenly to believe, that there are different points of view. I mean, even when you are tackling different plays, there are different, she connects things in a different way. And the, the fun and the playfulness for a performer to follow those traces, that I think, uh, in terms of acting, it's very interesting to start thinking about. And for my directing students, uh, would be how, when we step out and look at the big picture, how is the rhythm? And by rhythm, I don't only mean, mean the music, I mean the bodies on stage, the words, the objects she uses. I feel like her work, I know she did only one musical, I believe, but I would say her, her plays are filled with music. Mm -hmm. And you know, that is an amazing tool for a student, a directing mm -hmm. student, to sort of tune the ear to that. Mm -hmm. So if, going back to your question, that, that would be what I secretly would like to sneak in to them, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. I loved what you said about theatrical realism, and I loved what you talked about, you know, writing the other part of the play, because I think the thing that I also talk to my students a lot about is, as I say, this isn't realism. As soon as you approach it, as soon as you dwindle it down to realism, as soon as you dwindle it down to anything mundane, then you're just losing the power of it and the animal underneath it, the engine of it, the rhythm of it. And um, so I think it's actually, like you said, a great tool for acting students because it's um, it just you just like got to get to your animal self and just have at it. And yet be really specific with the language and get all the punctuation and get the joke and everything else. Yeah, that it's real fun. surreal thing you yeah. said is super. Because that's why you make theater, because it's not real, actually. <laughs> we're not just showing you a hospital room. <laughs> like, it's real surreal. That's, she's yeah. doing the whole thing. Yeah. I'm glad that people are talking about playfulness, too, mm -hmm. because I think um, my, what I encounter when I teach a lot, and I encountered it in myself and had to really combat it as I was becoming myself as an artist, is this pressure to be right and to make a correct choice or do something the right way, the right way, the right way. And um, and she's such a good example mm -hmm. of, I mean, she, she says in the film, you, you can watch part of an interview where she says, you know, when I started writing plays, I didn't know how to write a play. And so it's like being in a city without your map mm -hmm. and you have to kind of get lost and discover it every step of the way, every time. And, um, and her way forward, her, her plays can be so dark and so violent, but her spirit, as she writes them, is equally playful. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the darkest, most extreme theatrical moments in her plays arrived there by accident. You know, like mm -hmm. an accident will happen in rehearsal and she can say yes to that. Mm -hmm. And so that as, um, as a valid means of, mm -hmm as a valid form of intelligence, mm -hmm. playfulness, and, and accident mm -hmm. seems like a, 
something I'm really invested in imbuing my students with. Yeah, and by the little I know of how, you know, some of the plays were written, uh, you know, this idea of, of getting, for example, the first words yeah. in, a, in a cooking recipe, yeah. which is a, a very surreal be one way yeah. to start of playing. Yeah. And how can we connect that to the work of the actors, for yeah. example, you yeah. know, with that randomness, that trusting in, in the, and, and that made me think also something Alice was talking about, uh, not take, correct me if I'm wrong, like, no, not paying too much attention about what about the audience. I think it's about pleasing the audience. Because when I hear her plays, when I read them, I am touched, I, I, I am thought of. So I think it has to do with, let's play, and let's play wild here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then who's not gonna dive into that, Yeah. right? So it's not that I am here to be correct and to do the right yeah. things to please you and so you can clap for me, right. which is something there's a sickness in life yeah, right now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and thank God we're all against it at yeah, this yeah, yeah. table. Yeah. And she's one of the first ones, I yeah. feel, that is saying, uh, you know, let's go wild. Yeah, because mm -hmm. playfulness doesn't necessarily mean nice. Like, it can also be cruel. Like, Tango Palace yeah. is, like, the cruelest game ever, mm -hmm. but it is pure game. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think, though, the other thing, because this is something I'm always... so. I think there's two, I always feel like making theater in any kind of way is about balance, right? It's just one big balancing act. You know, public solitude in itself is a balancing act. You know, you're playing for a public, but you got to pretend you're on stage by yourself, unless you're breaking the fourth wall or doing something different. But um, this idea of playfulness, which of course, but I feel like there's so much specificity in her work. And that's, that's the key, I think, to, you know, great acting training, any kind of training is for the theater is that you work with abandon, you work with playfulness, but then there's so much specificity. The example you gave of, no, you walk this way. Mm -hmm. No, that doesn't work. You walk like this, mm -hmm. you walk like this. And it's true. It's, um, that's why I tend to think about directing as often sculpting, but your, your um, tools are often people's bodies and their voices and their imaginations. Mm -hmm. And how is it that you can help sculpt out of them uh, the performance that makes sense within the whole piece. And there's one way the joke works, and there's a thousand way it doesn't. Mm -hmm. And there's one way that the audience will feel affected in, in that moment, and there's a thousand way it doesn't. Mm -hmm. And I think from looking at the specificity, and you said efficiency of mm -hmm. language, um, it was you that said mm -hmm. efficiency of language, that um, she demands a sort of attention to that kind of detail. Mm -hmm. Or at least her work does. And I mm -hmm. think she did in real life too. From what I hear, mm -hmm. having not met her. I mean, there's this great moment in the film where she's riding the elevator and she's saying she doesn't trust experts, yeah. right? Mm. She doesn't trust experts, but with somebody who has faith in their own artistic, she goes like this, yeah, their own artistic <laughs> is all uh -huh. on my side of the artistic road. <laughs> I love that. And it's so, like, just from that scene, you can tell, like, she loves the specificity of language. And mm -hmm. her word choices are made for a reason. Mm -hmm. And so to direct the play and not ask the actors to pay attention to the, to the words or the way they're arranged on the page or the alliteration or just simply the word choice, every word that a character says mm -hmm. is worth, is you have to give it the energy that the love that she wrote it with, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, I want to make sure you guys have a chance to ask questions or our Yeah. Hi. Um, I watched the Reign of the Dutch from Love last month with two different classes and we also <laughs> have like, a post show chat with the cast. And I remember asking your actors, did you know anything about? <laughs> and I remember at the time feeling really annoyed by that because I was in the Bible class and it brainwashed me. <laughs> 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 so my, my question is, do you all as directors, do you feel like students, non-students, young people, otherwise actors, non-actors, when you're directing co work, do you prefer for your colleagues, your actors, to know contextually anything about IDP? Or is the dream really for your actors to find her, their own connection to her through the text and the text rule? Research is good. Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> 
and I've directed Cornette, and I, I usually assume that the actors won't know everything that I know about her. And so we start at the beginning, and we talk about not only her body of work, but also her biography and where she is now. And I think that's important to understand her trajectory as an artist and where whatever play it is falls in that trajectory because her work went through periods. Um, mm -hmm. Promenade is very different from Promenade of Life, mm -hmm. but they're connected in some ways. No, I think it's very important. And it's good for you for being irritated. It's fine. <laughs> <laughs> I, I tend to oh, have the opposite. Um, it's not that I don't want them to know. I want everyone to know about Fornes and like do her plays everywhere. And we should they they should be all over the place, you know. Um, but I, we never talked about her in rehearsal. Um, we talked about the play and her, where we see cho uh, a playwright's choices in the play. And because it, for me, not knowing her, I would be making all kinds of assumptions. Um, it, I think it would be different if I knew her. And I think for me. Um, I look for more an actor, actors who have particular skills, um, which are much related to sort of my interests, language, humor, um, ability to play, ability to put it all out there, because you certainly have to, and that animalistic drive, then I'm interested in like them knowing anything about her. I've started um, using the film to show to casts who are working on the play, mm, and great. for me it's become a really important uh, way that actors can um, stop being scared of the play because she's such a not scary figure in the film and it's a way to for them to feel comfortable like taking their gloves off and really diving in mm -hmm. and I tend to only re I refer to her constantly during rehearsal always as Irene never as Fornes because I want them to feel that she's this real person who is going for something when she was writing and she says like plays are meant plays are like meals you don't cook a meal just because you want to cook it you cook it so it'll be eaten and the same is true with the play it requires the actors and the performers and so it's a collaboration and I want cast to feel themselves in collaboration with her it's really helpful to understand how she wrote the plays and um, in terms of letting the characters lead so if there's any sort of dominant philosophy that I understand about how she went about making theater it's that you don't set out you don't choose a story you want to tell and then write a play to illustrate that story you enter an imaginary zone you let a, a space most often I think she would 
frequently she would start with a space, certainly her writing exercises often start with imagining mm -hmm. a space, and you let a character appear. Mm -hmm. You might give them a sentence that is pulled t totally arbitrarily from whatever book you're reading. Mm -hmm. They say something, somebody else says something back, and then you follow the lead, at least in the early drafts, and then you go back and hone and craft and you know see, understand the bones. And um, I think that that <laughs> it's and suddenly the word that flashed into my mind is anthropocentrism. Like, so I wonder if it's connected to the moment that we're in, in terms of like pl always placing ourselves in the center of how we perceive the world around us, or you know, the, and that we're that we need as a global community to move outside of anthropocentrism if we're ever going to be able to deal with what's happening with climate and and everything but she was able to to put herself over here and let the characters lead the way so maybe actually a threat is if, if his sort of framework is dialectics Fornes requires negative dialectics letting the object lead huh. yeah because I think she was like interested in the molecular level of humanness mm -hmm. like she is framing moment by moment like not even just femaleness but the yeah. molecular level of humanness as it moves through emotional yeah. Yeah. connections yeah. and that's what she's trying to yeah. dramatize which yeah. is incredible to try to dramatize and yeah. really different because i think Breck is being really interested in humanness but in what are the systems humans create mm -hmm. you know, right 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 and almost again to that mm -hmm. drill down to that the Animal. system's already working that? inside this us. Yeah. yeah. I also think that um, with Brecht, there's a clear, I, I think, right, he has a clear message he wants to get across. Mm -hmm. And I, I think that even though um, there's so much politics and social politics in, mm -hmm. in Fornes' play, I, I don't believe, and I'm, I could be wrong, that she's starting from a place of, I'm going to talk about yeah. a play about a dictator. I'm going to write a, you know. Right. And so, um, but I, <laughs> right. There is a message of er, yeah. Message under but I well. think also, and I, this is probably going to offend half the people here, <laughs> is that um, the only way her plays will stay alive well past her is if we don't try to do them the way she wanted them to be done, the way she would do them. And what I mean by that is, um, why would, well, how can there be 10 productions of mud a year if we're all trying to do the same production of mud? Mm -hmm. And I think just as much as she put herself as a director on top of the play that she then, she wrote, I think she, I believe that she would ask every director to come with their own playfulness. And as if they are in living in this place of theatricalized realism, Realism, as we know, our idea of what realism is on stage has changed throughout the decades, right? You look at like videos of Chekhov and you're like, what? That's not realism. People <laughs> never walked and talked like that, right? And what does realism look like in the 50s? What does realism on stage look like today? What is it going to look like 30 years from now, 50 years from now? And as realism changes um, and as our world changes, I think her plays are, are going to change. And, and you know, in the, we should be approaching her work in the same way that we approach Shakespeare's work. You know, if Shakespeare's work, you don't, if you don't understand the rhythm, then it falls apart. If you don't understand the comedy, then it falls apart. So it's the it same thing with her. If you don't understand the rhythm, if you don't understand the comedy, if you don't understand the, the poverty, if you don't understand all those basic things, it's going to fall apart. But all of us would do a different play, a different version of the same play. And I think that that's what's so exciting. And that's what will keep them alive. Right there. Yes. all those things in her play, like faithfulness, faithfulness and specificity and the rebelliousness have affected how you approach the becoming of her, like having a career in theater making. Like in your life, you know, because like, I feel like I'm constantly balancing actually just being inspired by her work and then wanting to go outside and like rip my clothes off and do everything and then, like, <laughs> you know, and I wonder as people actually like getting closer to my context of the world and the career of this, like, what she is, what she was, you know, how does she affect me? <coughs> I, it's so I talked to Donald Eastman, who was her set designer on a bunch of her shows in the 80s, early 90s, and she, he described how they would get together and do work, is that, you know, seven or eight or nine months would go by and Irene would 
gather up to, to write the play. She would gather the money. She would find the space, and they would do it. Seven or eight or nine months would go by. Same thing. Then you would get the call to say, "Here's I've got a script. Let's talk." And that kind of um, putting one foot in front of the other is, to me, a story about career. And to me, that is very inspiring, and it's a model that I adhere to, which is just keep waking up and putting one more foot in front of the other, and get up the money and find the space and do the show. And to me, and the story he told wasn't about Irene was at La Mama, and then she wanted to be in here at Theater Workshop, and then she wanted to be in front. <laughs> she wasn't climbing in that way. She wasn't coming up. She was moving forward. And that's, that's why I, I don't know if that's exactly your question, but that sparked that One thing Irene says is, um, writing plays was not a way of earning a living, but it, but it is a way of earning a life. And, um, and also, I mean, I think what Alice is saying is really true, but those steps sometimes weren't like just seven months apart. Like there were seven years between, I don't know which play, and Fefu. Tango Palace and Fefu because she was running her own theater company and was doing administration, administration that whole time. Mm -hmm. So also I think her quest to live as her artist self in the world honed in to writing plays and like in the to the end like she knew herself as a playwright when everything around her was in her memory was dropping off she asserts I am a playwright that's who I am that's what I do but it doesn't mean that she got on that train with with her first play in her early 30s or whenever it was and like kept going there's lots of variation so I think I learned that too like our 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 urges and our impulses can take lots of different forms as we're moving on our path, which is going to look totally different for every single person mm -hmm. moving through this career. Yes, it was Molly's dream. Oh, Molly's dream. Mm -hmm. So maybe one more question. I want to ask a question. So. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I feel like my student wants to ask a question. Uh, so I have to defer this. <laughs> <laughs> um, still figuring out how to ask this, so bear with me. Um, I love that we talked about kind of how. Uh, she as an artist, you know, wasn't necessarily making work for the audience and was more um, making it for herself. I think that's a really intriguing notion. I'm also intrigued by uh, the political and social relevance we've talked about that is able to be seen in her work. Right now, it's so fashionable in the theater industry to do socially political relevant work um, that I'm really, uh, I feel like there's kind of, when, when you have an artist who is making the work for themselves and not for the audience so much to speak. Um, basically, my question is, why do we need artists to, who are making work for themselves and not necessarily pandering to the audience? Why is that so important for us as theater makers? I have to say one thing. I don't think she was making... Uh, I think it would be unfair to say that she was making work for herself only. That uh -huh. sounds uh, the pretty the idea of the egotistic artist who, I don't care about you. It's all about me and my work and me and my mother, you know. And I don't <laughs> think she wasn't to that. Honestly, I feel that maybe that for herself and obviously people who have done more research than me may know this. That, but when you read the material, when you read the plays, it's 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 more that she's honoring herself, which is very different. Mm -hmm. When you honor who you are what attracts you, what inspires you. That's beyond what career you're going to build or if you're going to be successful or not, produce or not. I feel that when Katie was saying, even until the end she meant her, she saw herself a playwright. Maybe nobody put her on Broadway, ever. It has not happened, I think. Mm, it has. It, it happened? It, it failed. Okay. It, <laughs> it failed. For whatever reason it was, <laughs> it failed. Not for the quality. And that, I don't think, questions what is the the, the you know, what kind of <laughs> artist she is. But it's still, when you approach the work, I, I, I feel that a lot of people get extremely connected to it. Mm -hmm. So yeah. I don't know if we can talk about more than, I, I feel it's unfair to say that she was doing the work for mm -hmm. herself only. But I to address, oh, sorry. I, I was just gonna say real quick, uh, maybe it's useful to distinguish between doing work for an audience and doing work to an audience. Right, yeah. yes, that's a nice way to put it. And to like, but your question that you're asking, I think, a little bit that as I understand and then a little bit related to Irene is like 
yeah, she, a, an artist is asking questions that then they're trying to figure out out loud, a, a theater artist in the process, and that's what's going to answer these questions. So some top-down mandate that's not an organic question you're asking as an artist, I, I just don't have the same integrity. She was total integrity mm -hmm. at figuring out these questions about life and it's, I'm just being talking generally or through making these projects. Mm -hmm. That's gonna. That's why they're timeless. That's how it answers these things. And I think that has to be our the internal mandate as artists. Often is mm -hmm. answering these questions for ourselves personally mm -hmm. and having the guts to say them out loud. And it doesn't mean we always should. And they're always going to answer anything for ourselves or anyone else. Mm -hmm. But that's the whole effort, and that's what becomes shared s work that's out in so social spaces. Mm -hmm. Is our internal impulse to ask something and figure it out. Mm -hmm. And so that, I think, is, yeah, my That's response great. to that. My um, guess of uh, this idea about, um, you know, making work not for the audience, I think from my perspective what that means is um, that as a director say, you're not saying, well, what's going to please the biggest audience right now? Like, how can I, f how can all 300 people in this audience like this one moment? And how am I going to make it funny for them? As opposed to, I think it's funny like that. I don't think it's funny like that. I'm going to go with my instinct. Yep. Mm -hmm. And then, and my instinct, I hope, will make people happy. And if they don't, well, you know, we don't have the same instincts. And then I also think that what's interesting is um, she wrote these incredibly politicized and political mm -hmm. plays, not from coming from a, a, a trying to make a political play. And I think what that teaches us is that we're all political beings. We all walk in the world in a different way, and so we have so much politics and thinking about the world, and if we allow ourselves to tap into those animal instincts, those things are connected to our means of survival, how we try to survive the world, how we try to make good in the world, how we try to raise ourselves up in this world, and she, um, by making it most personal, deeply, really, really per like personal, like tapping deep into the imagination and deep into the deepest part of the memory I think she created some of the most political work we've seen, and that's actually why it's so terrifying to theater companies, <laughs> because they're so politicized. So I offer that. Well, please join me in thanking our panelists. Go have a big dinner together. Yeah, or all like. Together. Yeah, or all like.